But this year, we're going to be starting to look at the four Gospels collectively. Um, this means that as we go through the Gospels, we're going to attempt to view them chronologically and in harmony with one another, incorporating the similar messages um, into that day's teaching. <clears throat> Rearranging the books of the Bible chronologically isn't an easy thing to do. Bible scholars differ on many of the points of uh, the sequence of how things um, happened. Uh, none of the gospel writers really set out to do a precise timetable of the teachings and the events of the life of Christ, although Luke and Mark do come pretty close to it. The uh, important point is that <clears throat> Christ gave us these teachings, not the precise order in which they were delivered to us. Writing a chron chronological account wasn't their purpose. Each of the writers had a unique purpose in writing the gospel that they wrote. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels, meaning that they can be seen together. These gospels contain many of the same accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. These accounts are sometimes even presented as, general, uh, <clears throat> as the same general sequence with, between each of the different gospels. John, on the other hand, is quite different. It has about 92% um, new content uh, than the other Gospels. So weaving that in is going to be um, challenging, but possible. The Gospels are not a biography of Jesus' life. Two of them describe Jesus' birth and then virtually nothing for the next 30 years. <clears throat> the other two start with his adult ministry. That wouldn't have been a very good biography Jesus' earthly life was filled with many stories that could have been told. It tells us in John chapter 21, verse 25, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that not even the world itself could, could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. There are three things... <clears throat> three questions that I think we need to answer as we begin our study of the Gospels. The first one is, is why are there four Gospels and not just one? Another question, why did the authors of the Gospels choose to write what they did? And the third question is, <clears throat> what did they want us to learn about Jesus as they wrote? In uh, Gusto Gonzalez's book, The Story of Christianity, he said this, and this is a little lengthy, so hang with me. Apparently, churches in some cities or regions had a particular gospel which was most closely connected to their history and traditions. Such was the case, for instance, with the gospel of Luke in Antioch and the surrounding area. As contact among these churches developed, they began sharing these manuscripts and traditions, and thus the acceptance and use of a variety of gospels came to be seen as a sign of the unity of the church. <clears throat> and just to be clear, when we're talking gospel here, it's the, the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's not talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, <clears throat> the good news of his uh, death, burial, and resurrection. It's really talking about the manuscripts of the gospels. At a later time, <clears throat> back on the quote, at a later time, many have pointed out that the inconsistencies among the four Gospels is a matter in a matter of detail. Early Christians were well aware of those differences, and that was precisely one of the main reasons why they insisted in using more than one book. They did this as a direct response to the challenge of Marcion and Gnosticism. Many Gnostic teachers claimed that the heavenly messenger had entrusted his secret knowledge to a particular disciple who alone was the true interpreter of the message. The church at large sought to show that its doctrines were not based on the witness of a single apostle or gospel, but on the consensus of the entire apostolic tradition. The very fact that the various gospels differed in matter of detail, but agreed on the basic issue at stake, made their agreement a more convincing argument. <clears throat> We've talked about the Gnostics in the past but the Marcion um, reference that was quoted in here was actually from a, se a second century heretic who had many different errant views. He was known primarily for his belief 
that the Old Testament scriptures were not authoritative to Christians. He believed that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament were two different gods. Jesus then would have been the son of the New Testament God, but had, would have no association to the Old Testament God that is described in the Hebrew scriptures. And we know <clears throat> that that's not the case. Having the four Gospels rather than one adds credibility to the singular truth that is being taught in each. Having four different writers, four different perspectives, four different audiences, and four purposes, <clears throat> we will see different details and emphasis within the different Gospels. Working in harmony with each other, they paint a beautifully comprehensive picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are communicating their own point to a certain audience, so we will see some variation. While there are differences in detail, they are consistent with their message. Had all of the Gospels been identical, <clears throat> or there was a collaboration in a single Gospel book written, you would have the same story four different times, or a single account with no supporting documents. If all of the four Gospels were the same with no differences, critics would be accusing the writers of collusion. They would lead to the loss of credibility being seen as a contrived hoax. The differences in the Gospels show that there was no collusion and that the Gospels represent four unique but inspired accounts of the same events. <clears throat> There's another book out there, a more recent one, called Cold Case Christianity. Has anybody ever heard of that? It was written by a homicide detective. He was a devout atheist until he applied the same step-by-step -step investigative process that he utilizes as a homicide detective to the case of Christianity. He knows that witnesses will never agree in details of, the, of an event and will all focus on something different in that event. We know from human experience that different people will notice different things about the same event. It doesn't mean that they're lying or that anyone was wrong, just that they are coming at it from a different perspective. Additionally, Jesus' ministry spanned about three years. It's likely that he repeated some of his teaching on many different occasions. This may account for some of the differences in the gospel accounts on similar teaching. <clears throat> Jesus may have communicated the same truth on different, different occasions each time communicating that truth in a slightly unique way. This has led some scholars to conclude that, it looks <clears throat> that what looks like parallel accounts in the different Gospels may actually have been different events. Finally, Jesus may have spoken three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. If Jesus gave a teaching to, into his Jewish audience in Hebrew or in Aramaic, um, each gospel writer's rendering of the teaching of the gospel in Greek may have been slightly different than the others. All this may account for some of the differences in the gospel accounts of the similar teachings of Jesus. Regardless of some of this conjecture, the Bible writers were trustworthy in all that they wrote because they were inspired by God to write what they did. In 2 Timothy... Chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. <clears throat> it's the differences between the Gospels that validate them, that make them reliable. If God's intention was to give us four different accounts that would examine, <clears throat> that we could examine from reliable eyewitness testimony, he did a great job because that's exactly what we have. God knows what he's doing. We'll attempt to look at these four gos different gospel accounts together, but also not lose the purpose that each author had for their particular writing. So hopefully this sheds a little bit of light on the first question of why there are four gospels. The second question was, why did the author of the Gospels choose to write what they did 
and what did they want us to learn about Jesus? And for the next two, for the answering these two questions, we're going to look at each of the individual writers of those Gospels. <clears throat> Unlike Paul's epistles, none of the Gospels specifically identify the author of the book. There is some <clears throat> deductive evidence and church tradition that help us know who the writers were. Each do, however, identify the subject of the book, and that subject is Jesus. Particularly, I think this is an attempt to put the emphasis where it belongs, on the person and authority of Jesus Christ, and not on the author of the books. Let's look at each of the gospel authors in turn. First of all, Matthew. Well, the book of Matthew doesn't claim a writer in the text itself. It's been long held that the author of the book is Matthew, the tax collector, who was one of the 12 apostles. Matthew was also known as Levi. Two of the Gospels identify him as Matthew, and two of them uh, identify him as Levi. Matthew was a Jew, and he was writing to Jews. He offered a distinctly Jewish perspective on the ministry of Jesus. Matthew's desire was to present Jesus as the king of the Jews, the Messiah that was foretold in the Hebrew scriptures, <clears throat> and to explain God's kingdom. Matthew consistently took his readers back to the Old Testament <clears throat> prophecies regarding the birth of Jesus, Bethlehem as the location of Jesus' birth, the flight to Egypt, Herod slaughtering all of the infants, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and the circumstances of his death. All prophetic evidence of the person and nature of Jesus Christ. He included more than 50 direct citations to the Old Testament and even more indirect references. <clears throat> These, this exceeds any of the other Gospels and indicates that Matthew had the Jewish people in mind when he wrote this book. Matthew's commitment to grounding the life of Jesus in the Old Testament raised Jesus above the multitude of other false messiahs that had come and gone. He described our Lord's uniqueness among others to, eat, uh, to ever walk the earth, all pointing to the same conclusion, that Jesus Christ is the long-awaited Messiah, the King that was foretold. As we read through the pages of Matthew, <clears throat> not only do we see Jesus Christ revealed as Israel's King and Messiah, but his coming to earth as God in the flesh reminds us of his deep love for us. Now resurrected and ascended, the Lord Jesus will always be with us, even till the end of time. Our next gospel is Mark. <clears throat> like the book of Matthew, the scripture isn't specific about who authored this particular book. Tradition holds that it's Mark, also known as John Mark. <clears throat> While he wasn't one of the 12, 12 apostles, there's a fair amount of information about Mark in the New Testament. Luke had mentioned Mark's name several times in the book of Acts. <clears throat> For example, in Acts chapter 12, 12 through 14, it says, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. It's probable that Mark's most significant personal connection was the one he had with Peter. Peter was likely Mark's source for the material in this gospel. Mark's mother's house was a regular stop for Peter. In these verses, Peter had just been released from prison by an angel, and then he went directly to Mark's mother's home. It says that the servant girl recognized him by his voice alone, so she must have been very familiar with him. He also was identified as, as starting the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. He became significant in the life of Paul, being one of the last people the apostle mentioned in his final letter in 2 Timothy. It appears that Mark also was present in Gethsemane 
instead uh, identified as the young man who was watching the proceedings from a safe distance. While Matthew's gospel portrays Jesus as king, Mark's gospel reveals him not only as the Messiah, but also God's servant. If we look at Mark 10, verse 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark's gospel is fast-moving, given a sense that Jesus' time on earth was short, and that there was much to accomplish in the few years of his ministry. It was written for Gentiles, converts, and Roman believers. Its primary purpose is to emphasize that Jesus is the Son of God and to present his teaching. Mark filled his gospel with the miracles of Jesus. These miracles illustrated both the power and the compassion that Jesus had over the people in need. In this text, Mark portrays Jesus as both God and man, full of his deity, but also full of his humanity. He revealed Jesus as the good teacher who offered people spiritual regeneration as well as affecting their physical and circumstantial changes in their life. Mark shows us Jesus moving, serving, sacrificing, and saving. Jesus constantly pointed to the ultimate way in which he would serve humanity by his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. It is only through faith in the good news of Jesus Christ that we find eternal redemption. Additionally, Jesus becomes our role model for how we are to live our lives, serving others as he did. The challenge that Jesus presents in the book of Mark involves breaking out of our patterns of selfishness and giving ourselves in service and love to others. The next book is Luke. Luke's name, again, never appears in the gospel. However, Christian tradition unanimously credits this book to him. The prevailing view is that Luke was Greek and he was the only non-Jewish author of uh, any book or letter in the New Testament. Some would argue that uh, he was Jewish based on Romans 3, chapter, or verses 1 and 2, where it says that only the Jews were entrusted with the revelation of God. If we look at that verse, it says, What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. However, we also know that Luke was a companion of Paul, and in his final greetings to the Colossians, he indicated that only Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice were Jewish or of the circumcision. That would make Luke, who was with him, a Gentile. That verse in Colossians says four, <coughs> chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he, is, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. This would make Luke a Gentile and also very noteworthy in the construction of the New Testament as he also wrote the book of Acts. Luke gave a first-person introduction to his gospel, indicating that he composed the letter with the purpose of providing a careful rendering of the events of Christ's life. It says in chapter 1, verse 4, that he is writing an orderly account. Orderly meaning in order or consecutively, but it can also mean methodically or in a logical order. Like Paul, and unlike the other gospel writers, he never met Jesus while he, was, while he lived on earth. We know he was a doctor because Paul identified him as, a, as one in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. As a physician, Luke would have been trained to be a careful observer, knowing how to question and interpret and how to record. This is the most comprehensive of the four gospels. He would have been just the right person to record 
the accounts of Jesus and his ministry. Much of the material unique to Luke's gospel involves Jesus' interaction with individuals, many of them on the fringes of what would be called acceptable in society. Uh, sinners, tax collectors, lepers, women, and children among them. Luke's portrayal of Jesus reveals in our Lord a man who came to minister and show compassion to all people, no matter what their station in life. Just as Matthew portrays Jesus as king and Mark reveals him as a servant, Luke offers a unique perspective on Jesus as the Son of Man. The phrase Son of Man was Jesus' favorite way of referring to himself. It says in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Son of Man focuses on the humanity of Christ. Jesus Christ was truly human. He came in the flesh. This <clears throat> intentional lowering of his status from king of heaven to son of man is the epitome of humility and the embodiment of truth and grace. He is serving, or he is deserving of the title son of man. He is also deserving of the title son of God which we'll see when we get to John's gospel. Jesus walks through Luke's gospel, illustrating his deep and abiding love and care for people, regardless of what they have done and regardless of their status in society. Like the people Jesus interacted with along the way, he loves you no matter what you've done and no matter your circumstances in life. The fact that the eternal God lowered himself to take on human flesh, to make himself subject to human limitations, and ultimately die a gruesome death on the cross, shows us clearly how much God cares for us, and in turn, how we are to care for others. Our last gospel is the Gospel of John. In conjunction with the test, unanimous testimony of early Christians, who declare that John was the disciple who laid his head on Jesus at the Last Supper and was called the disciple who Jesus loved. Found in John 13, 23, the author of the gospel identifies himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. We look in chapter 21, verse 20. It says, Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Then it goes on to say in verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So speaking of himself here. So there is an explicit claim in the gospel that this particular disciple, the disciple who Jesus loved, identified as John, is the author of this gospel. This could have been John's way of saying, my most important identity is not my name, but being loved by Jesus, the Son of God. John is the brother of James, the son of Zebedee. These were the brothers that Jesus um, called to as part of the 12 apostles, and he gave the names the Sons of Thunder. John's gospel is not the life of Christ. It is a powerful argument for the incarnation, a conclusive demonstration that Jesus was and is God himself, the creator of the universe, and the only source of salvation. His message is directed to new believers and to those non-believers who are searching to prove conclusively that Jesus is the Son of God and that all who believe in him will have eternal life. In keeping with his purpose of showing Jesus as God, John didn't start his gospel with the birth of uh, Christ, but instead chose to go back to the very beginning of history. John made a direct link between the nature of God and the nature of the Word, Jesus Christ. He emphasized the deity of Christ, his eternal nature, 
and his role in creation. John is very clear about his purpose for writing. And there's a verse that encapsulates this reason, verse 31 of chapter 20, where it says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John presented an exciting and distinctive picture of Jesus Christ. His account is a complete harmony with the portrayals of Jesus in the other three Gospels, adding significantly to the Bible's revelation about his origin, his purpose, his authority, his character, and his deity. The whole gospel, <clears throat> with its signs and miracles, is pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is a call to faith in Jesus who provides eternal life to those who believe. To know God, you must know Jesus. The only one and the only way to the Father is through the Son. Jesus' work on our behalf makes our salvation certain. Because he is God, his sacrifice on the cross can atone for our sins and have eternal implications. We can place our confidence in him because of his divine nature. For the readers of John's gospel, the question is simple but significant. Do we believe that Jesus is Lord? If you believe, you will receive eternal life, claiming the truth that you will one day live in the presence of God in a place with no more pain, no more tears, and no more death. It's probably time to get to our verses for today. So I'm going to bring Amelia up, and she's going to read the verses for today. If you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, and then we're also going to cover Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. John 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at Father's side. He has made him known. Luke 1, 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me, having also followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopilus, that you may have certain certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Matthew starts his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus Christ because he was writing to a Jewish audience. This would prove that Jesus was both a descendant of King David and also of Abraham, just as the, as the Hebrew scriptures had prophesied about the, the Messiah. The Jewish people would have to understand this in order to consider Jesus to be the Messiah. Mark jumps right into the narrative 
of John the Baptist and doesn't mention Jesus' birth. Because Mark's audience was primarily Roman Christians, he was following a common practice that important Roman officials would be preceded by an announcer or a herald of their approach. When a herald arrived, the citizens knew that someone important was coming. By following this practice in his writing, the readers would have eagerly looked for the person being announced. Mark was identifying John the Baptist as the herald, whose mission it was to announce the coming of Jesus, the most important person to ever live. Luke here writes a short introduction and addresses the gospel to Theopolis. His name means loved by God. This has led some to believe that Theopolis is just a generic title that applies to all Christians. Although it seems clear that Luke is writing to a specific individual, even though the message is intended for Christians of all generations. Luke also addressed the book of Acts to the same person. While we can't know for sure who Theopolis was, Luke's reason for writing to him was as it states, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Luke wrote an historical account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and detailed the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. His intention was to provide an orderly account that was true and trustworthy by gathering information from eyewitnesses, by recording the details of what they knew to be true, and then sharing it with Theopolis so that the good news of Jesus Christ could be spread to the world. John goes back even further and starts his gospel account <coughs> Uh, at the very beginning of all things physical. If we look at John, the first five verses, <clears throat> it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or in some verses, did not overcome it. <clears throat> in uh, these verses, John isn't saying that Jesus had a beginning. He states unequivocally that Jesus is God. What he's saying is that when everything that we know today was made in this physical world, Jesus was there and everything was made through him. Jesus is the light of the world. He declares such himself later in John. Jesus was claiming that he is the exclusive source of spiritual light. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, it says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had him by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. <clears throat> Without light, it's impossible to sustain life and life of any kind here on earth. If the sun were to quit shining, everything would die. Jesus being the true light means he is our essential source of life. Nothing of this world can change that. No evil, no darkness, not even Satan himself can overcome it. Jesus is the true light of God for those who partake in his salvation. When we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God's light shines in our hearts. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Look at the next verses. <clears throat> We're going to look at verses 6 through 9 in John and then jump to um, verse 15. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness to the light. 
That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And then jumping to verse 15. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he who, whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. In these verses, John introduces John the Baptist as a messenger of God. He was sent to tell people about the coming Messiah and encourage them to repentance that they may believe in Jesus. The author John makes it clear in his writings that John the Baptist is not the Messiah, but a witness to the one who would come. In verse 15, John the Baptist also made it clear that he wasn't the Messiah. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, that says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Our next verses, and if you want to just jump to, your, uh, <clears throat> to the Bible, we're in verses 10 through 14. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. <clears throat> Although Jesus created the world, the people he created did not always recognize him. Even though the entire Hebrew scripture pointed to the coming of Jesus, the Jews, the people of God, the ones chosen to prepare the rest of the world for the Messiah, rejected him. In contrast, all who receive Jesus as Lord and Savior are reborn spiritually. They are brought from death to life. Your infant birth gives you a physical life and puts you in the family of your parents. Being born again makes you spiritually alive and puts you in God's family. This is only possible because the Word became flesh. Jesus took on humanity and lived on earth with us, experiencing the same kind of hardships, the same pain, the same temptations, but yet without sin. God's glory was shown to us in the person of Jesus Christ. The final verses for today. <clears throat> and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Moses' ministry brought a knowledge of the law and justice. But the law could only show us how <clears throat> our sin and how broken we are. It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We are all corrupted by our sin, and there is nothing that we can do out of our own strength that will atone for it. No amount of good works, no amount of penance, no restitution. We are condemned. Jesus brings us truth, but also brings us grace and mercy and forgiveness. The ultimate expression of God's love for mankind is grace. Grace is described as giving something to someone that they don't deserve. Instead of simply telling us that we are broken, Christ gave us a way to fix all that was wrong. Only through grace in the fullness, or only through Christ in the fullness of grace and truth is fully realized. His grace is offered freely and without cost to whoever will receive it. This is the message of the Gospels. And I pray that during our study, the message of the good news will come alive for all of us in a powerful way.
I'm looking forward to that journey together. Let's pray. Lord God, our Father, we thank you so much for giving us an account of uh, Jesus' life, his purpose, uh, all that he has done. We thank you for the assurance that you've given us in your word that we don't walk this world alone, but that you are with us through your Holy Spirit and that we can trust in you for all things that your promises are assured, that our salvation is assured based on our faith and our love for, love for you. And we pray, Lord, as we go through the, uh, this good news, that it does become more real to us and that we, we begin to live out that life more, more fully in our daily lives. So we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for all you've done. We thank you for your word, and we pray in your name. Amen.